unstimulated, neurons maintain a constant electrical difference, or potential, across their cell membranes. This potential, called resting potential, is always negative inside the cell, and ranges from negative 40 to negative 90 millivolts. If a neuron is stimulated, the negative potential inside the neuron can be made either more or less negative, depending on the stimulus. If potential is made sufficiently less negative, it reaches a level called threshold, and an action potential is triggered. During the action potential, the neuron suddenly becomes 20 to 50 millivolts positive inside. Action potentials last a few milliseconds before the cell restores its negative resting potential. The cell membrane of a neuron encloses cytoplasm with various ions dissolved in it. The neuron itself is immersed in a salt solution, the extracellular fluid. The ions of the cytoplasm consist mainly of positively charged potassium ions and large negatively charged organic molecules, such as proteins. Outside the cell, the extracellular fluid contains mostly positively charged sodium ions and negatively charged chloride ions. Since charged particles cannot pass through the lipids that make up cell membranes, they must travel through channel proteins that extend through the membrane. In an unstimulated neuron, only potassium ions can cross the membrane, traveling through specific proteins called potassium channels. Although sodium channels are also present, in unstimulated neurons, they remain closed. Since only potassium ions can cross the membrane and potassium ions are more concentrated inside the cell, they diffuse out of the cell, leaving the large negatively charged organic ions behind. As more and more positively charged potassium ions leave, the inside of the cell becomes increasingly negative. But since opposite charges attract, as potassium ions diffuse out, an electrical force develops that tends to pull them back inside. At some point, the diffusion of potassium ions out of the neuron due to concentration differences is balanced by the electrical attraction tending to pull them back inside. This is the point at which neurons reach resting potential. Reaching resting potential in this way does not require significant changes in the potassium concentration inside or outside the cell. Only about one ten thousandth of the potassium ions initially inside a neuron must leave to create a resting potential of negative 60 millivolts. But it is action potentials, not resting potentials, that carry information through a nervous system. What you will see and hear in this presentation is the development of myelin in the peripheral nervous system and the propagation of the action potential along a myelinated axon. This multimedia presentation will be most helpful if you already have a good understanding of the Schwann cell and the electrochemical process of the neuron, called the action potential. The Schwann cell forms a protective covering around the axon. Schwann cells start to develop in the embryo and continue to increase the wrapping around the axon through childhood. This development increases the thickness of the wrappings which peaks in adolescence. This is why teenagers have such quick responses. The Schwann cell contains the typical cell organelles and cell membrane structure. However, notice as the Schwann cell surrounds the axon that the nucleus and other organelles are squeezed to the outside wrapping of the cell. This outer wrapping of the Schwann cell is called the neurolemma. The inner lining is made up of layers upon layers of cell membrane. This inner wrapping is called the myelin sheath. You will recall that the cell membrane, called the fluid mosaic model, is made up of a bilayer of lipids integrated with proteins. The thicker the myelin, in other words, the more layers of cell membrane making up the myelin, the more advantageous it is to the axon. One advantage is the regeneration of severed axons. Another advantage is an increase in the speed of the propagation of the action potential along the axon. The rest of this presentation will concentrate on the increased speed of action potentials down the length of the myelinated axon. Here is the neuron, and you can see the repeated Schwann cell membrane forming the myelin. Note that there is a small space between the Schwann cells where the axon is not covered by the neuroglial cell. These spaces are called nodes of Rambier, 
From what you already know, action potentials occur at the axon hillock and continue to be repeated away from the cell body, much like dominoes falling one after another. An action potential starts on a polarized membrane, which is negative 70. A stimulus causes the sodium gates to open slightly and sodium starts to trickle into the cell. If the cell reaches negative 60 or threshold, the sodium gates open wide and sodium floods in, bringing the inside of the axon to positive 30. At this point, the sodium gates close and potassium gates open. Potassium starts to pour out of the cell. This allows the neuron to become polarized again. Then the sodium-potassium pump starts to actively transport sodium out and potassium back into the neuron. First we will look at the propagation of the action potential in the unmyelinated axon. Propagation is the repeating of action potentials down the axon. The action potential is repeated because as the sodium comes in, it diffuses to adjacent areas within the axon. As the sodium increases in this area, threshold is reached. Sodium gates open wide, sodium rushes in, causing depolarization and an action potential. As the sodium enters this area, it diffuses through the axoplasm and another action potential is created. This continues down the length of the axon. Now look at the myelinated axon. The same process applies to the myelinated axon. An action potential develops and as the sodium comes in, it diffuses through the cytoplasm of the axon. It continues to diffuse through the portion of the axon wrapped in myelin. The increased sodium concentration reaches the node of Ranvier, increases the axoplasm to negative 60, and depolarization occurs. The sodium gates open wide, sodium floods in, and we have an action potential. Again, the sodiums diffuse through the axoplasm, reaching the next node. An action potential develops. The process is continued down the myelinated axon, passing from node to node. Compare the unmyelinated axon with the myelinated axon. You can see that action potential reached the end of the myelinated axon more rapidly than the unmyelinated axon. The speed of the propagation is faster going from node to node than action potentials that develop adjacent to the previous action potential. The process of excitation-contraction coupling consists of all those processes involved between the time of generation of the action potential on the muscle sarcolemma and the actual contraction. As the action potential reaches the neuromuscular junction, Vesicles containing acetylcholine fuse with the membrane of the nerve terminal and acetylcholine is released into the cleft. Acetylcholine molecules rapidly diffuse across the cleft and bind to the acetylcholine receptors. Binding of acetylcholine to receptors immediately opens ion channels, allowing sodium ions to rush into the muscle fiber and potassium ions to diffuse out. Acetylcholine is then split to acetate and choline by cholinesterase, resulting in inactivation and closure of the channel. The initial flux of ions due to opening of the channels brings the membrane potential to threshold, causing the voltage-gated sodium channels in the vicinity to open. The resulting action potential is propagated over the entire surface of the muscle and also courses into the T-tubule system. As the action potential encounters DHP receptors in the T-tubules, it causes opening of the ryanidine calcium channels of the lateral sacs, thus allowing calcium ions to diffuse out of the lateral sacs and into the region of the myofibrils. Calcium then binds to troponin, resulting in movement of the tropomyosin-troponin complex away from myosin binding sites on actin. The contraction process continues as long as action potentials continue to reach the neuromuscular junction, thereby keeping the concentration of calcium elevated around the myofibrils. To end the contraction, calcium must be actively transferred by the calcium pump, calcium ATPase, back into the lumen of the lateral sacs. This pump utilizes ATP as a source of energy. This process reduces the concentration of calcium in the vicinity of the myofibrils
such that calcium dissociates from troponin. Tropomyosin again covers myosin-binding sites on actin, and the muscle relaxes.